So, um, hey everyone, my name is Daniel Almeida. I'm with Calabra, and I'll be speaking to you all today about video codecs and the virtual seedless decoder driver, which is a driver I worked uh, uh, I worked at one or two years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we're gonna be talking a little bit more. I wanna start by uh, basically introducing myself first a little bit, and then we're gonna talk more about video codecs, what they are, why we need them, um in, in 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 this day and age and after we talk a little bit more about video codecs about the uh Vifrel 2 um video codec api and how it works then we can talk a little bit more about the device driver proper what it is uh what its purpose uh what it does and and, and how you can uh run it on on your machine so without further ado let's get started but first who am i I was a Linux kernel mentorship uh, program mentee. I, I joined Collabora in, in, in 2021. And nowadays I, I, I mostly define myself as a person who is working both in the streamer. Um, so the, we're gonna talk a little bit more about what the streamer is. The streamer is a multimedia um, framework um, for, for Linux, for other platforms as well. Uh, so, so I'm mostly doing multimedia related um, software in, in, in programming and JStreamer. And I'm also involved in, in, in the interaction between JStreamer and, and, and the Vifrel2 um, um, subsystem, basically. So most of my contributions are multimedia related. And I also uh, work with other um, video codec APIs like VA API. Uh, most people have heard a lot about VA API. I think it's the it's the um, most famous video acceleration API we have out there for Linux today. So um, on top of Vifrel2, I also work with other, other um, APIs like VA. So anyhow, without further ado, let's get started. So what are video codecs, which is you know, the main topic of this presentation? So video codecs, they exist basically because, well, otherwise we couldn't have video um, like in, in this day and age, why? Because video, you know, from a very long time now, it's been, it's it's growing in, in resolution. So nowadays like 4K full HD and 4K are pretty common. So uh, it's, it's, it's becoming bigger and bigger and more demanding each and every year. And if, if we didn't have video codecs, we wouldn't be able to transmit video, um, to stream video online and to feasibly store a video in, in our machines, it would be too, too big for, 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 for that. Um, so, but not all video is compressed. This is, this is one thing I, I wanna say, by the way. If, if, if you have like, let's say if you have a, 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 a video game console and you're connecting that through HDMI to your television, that's not compressed video. But for all other purposes like storing or streaming through streaming services, then yes, that has to be to be compressed. Otherwise, it's simply too big. But lucky for us, um, video signals, they're full of exploitable redundancies. What do I mean by this? There's a whole lot of information in, in video signals by the very nature of, of video signals themselves that we can um, exploit in order to reduce the file size. And this is what video codecs are. They're... Um, they're pieces of, of code basically that can compress a raw video signal um, and decompress that video for, for presentation at a later time by capitalizing on the, on the redundancies that are inherent to, to video signals. But most of the time this process is lossy. What it means is that if you have a signal, a raw video coming from let's say a sensor like a camera and you, and you compress that, uh, most of the time when you decompress that, the result isn't going to be as, um, as good as the original, basically. And, and this is the whole, this is the whole trade-off, right? You want to, to compress efficiently and arrive at a, uh, passable approximation that most of the time isn't going to be as good as what you had before, but it's passable. You can still, um, use that, um, almost as well as you could use the original signal. So as I said, the objective is to arrive at a passable approximation for a given bit rate and power envelope. 
Bit rate, by the way, is the amount of bits per second the encoder can put out. So, so again, let's go back to a, to a camera. A camera will be taking, it will be sampling like the environment and then tr uh, uh, translating that into a video signal. And once you get that through, through, a, through an encoder to produce a compressed video signal, um, one of the things that you can tune is how many bits per second you want that encoder to put out. And it's pretty trivial to understand that if you allow the encoder to put out more bits, then you're going to have a better result, right? You tend to have a better result because you're allowing it to produce more information, to have a larger file size. Uh, and if you allow the encoder to use more power, to use more um, computational power, then you may also have a, a, a better um, a better result. But these things, they're at odds with, with each other, right? You want you know the best quality that you can have, uh, at presumably at a acceptable bit rate. You don't want it to be too high. You want to compress as much as you can, and you don't want to use a lot of power. You wanna you want to have something that doesn't use a lot of power, especially in this day and age of mobile devices and and battery power devices. And you also don't you don't want to heat up your machine too much. So this is basically what a what a video codec is. The name codec is is shortened from um, from from video encoder slash decoder. That's where the name codec comes from. And usually a codec will put out a spec file, which says, uh, a, a, I'm sorry, a codec standard will put out a spec file that says, here how you should decompress this data. And I said decompress because only uh, uh, only video decoding, uh, so decompression is is a standardized. And the logic here is you don't standardize how you encode it because you want to, you want people to innovate at the encoding side of things, right? You want people to come out with better and faster ways to 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 do video encoding, and it's okay so long as it decodes, and then you only standardize the decoding portion. So if you go online and you look for the um, for for the video codec standards out there. For instance, H.264 is a very famous one, HVC or VP9 or AV1. What you're going to come across is a spec file that says how you can decode a H.264, HVC, VP9 stream, basically. And I said that video codecs, they're, they operate on the basis that you can compress video by exploiting redundancies. And what are these redundancies, right? So, and, and very quickly here, because um, we don't want to waste too much time with this, but like we have, a, we have different types of redundancies. The first one being the most obvious one actually being spatial redundancy, which is the understanding that pixels close to one another, they tend to be similar in value. So if you take a picture, a, a, a photograph of someone, and if you look at their um, skin color, the pixels are going to be roughly the same color. If you look at their shirt, they're going to be roughly the same color. If you look at the background uh, at a given particular object in the background, the pixels are going to be roughly the same color. So it's the understanding that we can compress video by understanding that pixels close, close to one another, they tend to be similar. So we don't need to encode that much information. We can just copy from adjacent pixels. Um, we have also temporal um, compression. And because video is just a sequence of frames, right? So you basically are playing a bunch of static images at a fast enough rate that your brain interprets that as, as being video and not a bunch of images stitched, stitched together. Uh, and, and temporal compression is you understand that if, if you have, if you have a, a picture, the next picture after it, um, uh, well, there are exceptions of course, but, most of the time, the, 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 the pictures after it, the adjacent pictures, they're going to be similar, especially if you increase the, the frame rate. Let's say you're capturing video at 60 frames per second. The amount of elapsed time between, between the frames is going to be so little that very, uh, very few things are going to have occurred in, in the environment. You know, Not a whole lot is going to have changed. So this can also lead to compression. You say, well, if, I, if I'm taking a bunch of pictures and they look alike, I don't need to encode information for all of them. I can encode just one of them and say, 
Well, you can you can derive the the following picture from the pictures before it, and this is also a a huge source of of compressing video video data. We have chroma subsampling. Chroma subsampling is is the understanding that our eyes are more um, they can perceive changes in the intensity of light much more than it can perceive uh, changes in the color information. So if you take a video signal. It, it depends on how you're encoding it, but most of the time in video, we work with something called YUV. So it's three planes. The, the Y plane or the Luma plane is the plane containing the, the, um, the information on the intensity of light, kind of. And then the UV plane is what gives the picture the color, right? It's, 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 the, it's the information on, 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 on the color um, of the image. And if you, if you downsample the, the UV plane, you do not notice um, a, a a you don't notice as much degradation as you would if you downsampled the Luma plane, the Y plane. So this is also a source of compression. You can say, well, we can slash half the the color information in a picture, and most people, you know, actually the majority of people aren't going to be able to tell the difference anyways. And we can slash away a whole bunch of data that we would otherwise have to encode. There's also quantization. Um, quantization is just a fancy term for division, basically. So without getting too much into how into into the specifics of video codecs, but at some point you're going to be translating the video signal into the frequency domain, and then you're going to be um, dividing that uh, against uh, a, a a a given quantization value. And the idea is, when when you start quantizing these coefficients, you can you you, you can have them go towards zero or be close enough to zero that you do not have to to um, to encode them to send them basically and this is one of this is also another source of source of compression and and if you quantize the, but this is lossy right when when you start quantizing coefficients um, you start losing information so if you're too aggressive if you use a, a if you use too high of a quantizer value, you start noticing degradation pretty quickly. So you have to be really careful not to quantize too aggressively. Otherwise, yes, you're going to get a smaller file, but you're also going to get quality degradation. You have entropy coding, which is using a uh, probability distribution to sort of um, also achieve compression. And you know the state of the art nowadays, I think, is using AI, basically, and machine learning to detect new ways to, to, to compress and, and decompress video. So these are like the, the compression techniques that we can use to um, to, to 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 compress and, de and, and decompress and 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 have video be actu actually actually um, streamable and, and and transmitted to the internet and stored in a hard in a hard drive and so on. Okay. With all that said, my question is: Can we make this faster? Why? Because we're human beings, right? We like faster stuff. We like performance. We like, especially, we like you know. Um, we like when we get things to go faster, consuming less power. I think, again, especially in a world of um, in a world of mobile devices and and, and battery operated um, devices. So, so can we make can we make this faster? And yeah, we can make it we can make it faster through through uh, hardware accelerators, basically. So by by using hardware accelerators, we can we can implement the, the encoding of the decoding and hardware, and we can be more power efficient. We can we can have the main CPU idling for longer because the the actual um, video encoding or decoding is going to be taking place into a uh, into hardware that that will free up the main CPU for it to do other things, right? But this also comes with a few drawbacks. One of which being that it's less flexible because once you synthesize that into hardware, um, unless you have an FPGA, right? But most people don't have an FPGA just laying around. They're they're using um, their GPUs or their CPUs, and once you synthesize that into hardware, there's not much that you can can do. So uh, what I mean is you're going to you're going to be limited to what was synthesized. And video codecs they work with different profiles because y'all can imagine that the requirements for an IMAX movie theater, for instance, or live broadcasting, um, they're very different from people watching 
um, let's say YouTube or any other streaming service. So the way that we solve this is we have different profiles, different profiles that will give you different levels of quality, levels of of support and and service, basically for for a given for a given um, use case, basically. And once you synthesize that into hardware, if if your if your particular video encoding or decoding IP only supports say a given set of profiles and you want to decode a higher profile, you're obviously not go going to get it. So, so, so it's, it's a less flexible approach, obviously. And the other drawback is that, well, now you need driver support for this. Why? Because now you have hardware to drive, right? So, so you need driver support. You, you have to have a driver um, in, in, in order to use the hardware. And you also need an API to communicate with, um, with this driver. So again, we use APIs to communicate with the underlying driver and hardware accelerator. So enter the world of video codec APIs, because if we want to have a, a, an accelerator, we have to have a, a video codec driver and a video codec API to drive it. So some of, some of the video codec APIs that we have out there, in particular um, on Linux. So we have VA API, which was created by Intel primarily for Unix-like systems, but it also works on Windows and, and other platforms. We have the XVA from, from Microsoft for Windows and for Xbox. We have proprietary um, we have proprietary APIs like NVENC and NVDEC for people with NVIDIA GPUs. We have new up and coming um, APIs like Vulkan Video, which is um, using Vulkan to, to do video decoding. And we also have like video for Linux and other ones. I, I've just listed a few a few video APIs here. So why do we have so many video codec APIs? Well, because some are suitable for some platforms and some are suitable for other platforms. So if you don't have an NVIDIA card, you're not going to be using NVDEC or NVENC. Um, if 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 you have if if you don't have a, a if you if your video decoding or encoding IP is not part of a of, of a GPU, then you're you're probably not going to be using VA API, which is based on uh, on the understanding. I'm sorry, which which supports video codec IPs uh, in in GPUs basically. So the different video APIs, um, video codec APIs out there, they cater to different use cases, to, to different hardware. And this is why we have so many of them. And this is, this is also a presentation um, about the Linux kernel, right? So how, how, is, how is the kernel related to everything I have just said? Because so far we, we have spoken about um, video codecs, what are video codecs? Um, we, we have... Um, we have spoken about different APIs and now how is the kernel related to, to all of this? And, and the answer is, well, some APIs out there like VA, they, they basically have a huge user space component. So if you're using VA API, let's say on Linux, what's happening is you have a user space application, let's say um, Chrome or Firefox or VLC or whatever, and then this, this um, user space application is going to be making calls into VA API. And then VA API is going to be um, sending these calls to a VA driver. But this VA driver will be mostly in user space. So if you have Intel hardware, this is going to be Intel Media Session, if I'm not mistaken. Um, if you have an AMD GPU, um, the support is going to be provided by Mesa. Um, so, so eventually you're going to have a, a huge user space component. And this user space component is going to basically um, tell the kernel, um, well, send a command buffer to the kernel saying, well, I want to decode video. Here's the addresses, uh, various addresses that I have to set up in order to, to drive the hardware to decode video. Um, so, so the user space component will be in charge of setting up everything. And basically, the kernel the kernel part will be responsible for like allocating buffer objects in GRAM and scheduling jobs in the GPU for execution, for instance. But my point being, some codec APIs out there they have a huge user space component, 
and a much thinner um, kernel space uh, driver. Other uh, video codec KPIs like video for Linux, they have basically no user space component. So the driver, I'm sorry, the the app, be it um, Chrome or Firefox or any other app, they're making calls directly to the kernel. And then the, the, the kernel driver has to account for that. It has to be, it's 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 bigger than 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 what we have for like VA API and other codec APIs. So the client program will use an API to talk directly to the kernel, and then the kernel will program the hardware. And this API that we're going to be using to talk to the kernel, um, in this particular case, we call it a UAPI, user space API, an API the user space can use in order to tell the kernel how to set up the device and how to program the device in this, in this particular case to encode or decode video. So this talk is uh, about the, the VFRL2 codec APIs and, and, and the Vizal driver, right? And what is video for Linux 2? Well, it's a framework slash API for various multimedia devices. So cameras, digital television, um, radio tuners, and other, other devices. I don't really care about these devices for the for the purpose of this presentation. For this presentation, I am interest, I'm mostly interested in the support in video for Linux for video codecs. And it turns out that it does have support for video codecs as well, um, as of recently. And I say as of somewhat recently because I think stateful support has been there for, I don't know, maybe 10 years, I'd say, but stateless support has been there for much uh for much less time, for like from 2017, I think, was the first iteration for stateless support in the Linux kernel and video for Linux too. And I'm I'm using these terms stateful and stateless um, APIs, and I'm going I'm going to talk much more about what these are. So so don't worry if, if you don't understand what what this, these two terms mean. And before we can talk about the default two APIs and and stateful and stateless APIs and, and what these things they mean. We have to first understand what is inside a codec bitstream. So let's say you're on a website and you're watching a, 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 a video file, a clip, or you have downloaded a, a, a video file to your computer. Um, what is in there, right? Um, so the, 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 the most obvious thing to be in there is the compressed video data. That's that's the, the most what everybody is expecting to be there, right? But it's not all. There's more things in a file. And the other major component that you're going to find inside inside a bitstream is something that we call the metadata. And why do we have metadata? Well, because with only the compressed video data, turns out that you're not able to decode it. You need an extra block of metadata to be able to drive the decoding process, to set up some state to control the decoding process, basically. So this metadata is sent together with the actual um, compressed data into a single package or unit, let's say, that you, you can then open up and, and, and use that um, to decode. So as I was saying, inside the stream we have metadata, right? That, that block I've just shown. So this metadata, it controls the decoding process. It can be data that persists, metadata, I'm sorry, that persists between frames, meaning, hey, we've, I've just started a, a, a stream and I want to, to give you some data that I want to be valid for the entire duration of the stream. Let's say you're watching a movie. Well, I want to, to persist data that's valid for like 15 minutes or for the entire movie, you can do this. Or another thing that you can do or that you must do actually, is, well, I want to have metadata that is going to apply to a given particular frame, uh, which is going to be, if you're familiar with uh, with some, some codec APIs out there, a, a, a typical uh, metadata that applies for, for, for a lot of frames at once is like a SPS, which stands for sequence parameters, or a PPS, which stands for, for uh, picture parameters, or VPS, for instance. These things, they... They, they apply to more than one frame. Or you can also have metadata that, that applies to a single frame. And on top of that, as I said, you have the actual compressed data that you have to decompress. 
Well, why are we speaking about this, right? At first, the same that it seems unrelated, but it really isn't, because this metadata block is what defines um, the, the handling of this metadata block is what is what differentiates between a stateful um, video codec device and a stateless video codec device. So, in a stateful codec device, as the name implies, what 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 is happening is the hardware is taking the entire chunk. It's taking both the compressed data and the metadata, and it's um, keeping track of this metadata internally because it has a microcontroller that is running its own firmware internally that can, um, A, parse the bitstream to extract what is the metadata and what is the compressed data, and B, keep track of this metadata in internally within within the, the the driver itself within the the, the the device itself and it can keep it can keep tra track of this metadata and and you can think of a stateful device I think the most helpful way to think of a stateful device is like a black box well why a black box well because you're sending data the stateful device is taking in the data it's doing its own thing with its own firmware and it's giving you decoded frames back and you don't really have to know how or, or how it's doing it. So it's kind of a black box. You push data in and you get um, encoded or decoded data back. In contrast, a stateless device is actually the opposite. It works like, if, if the stateful device works like a black box, a stateless device works like a clean slate. So not only do you have to feed it the compressed data to decode but you also have to feed it the metadata on a frame per frame basis to actually, uh, so that it can actually decode um, the data for you. It's much simpler. It cannot keep track of the metadata on its own. So it exposes registers that you have to set uh, with the values that you extract from this metadata so that it can actually decode the, the data. So these are, the, these are the main differences between stateful. Stateful can keep the state within the device and stateless basically can't. And with stateless devices, you have to uh, manually program the metadata. Um, you have to extract the metadata in user space and then tell the kernel um, that you want to program the device with the metadata and what the actual values for the, the metadata um, are basically. So stateless devices, they tend to be simpler uh, because they can keep track of less things on their own. But in turn, you need more software. You need more, more code in order to drive them. So a, 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 a stateless API is, is a little bit more complicated because it needs to, to also expose some way for you, for, for the programmer, to send this metadata to, to, um, to the kernel somehow so that the kernel can send this metadata to the device. And the way that we do this is through, through what we call the code IQ API. So we, the, the whole idea is we parse the stream in software. So we're parsing it inside of, let's say, GStreamer or Firefox. Actually, I think Firefox is using FFmpeg, which is another library, a very famous library in Linux. So we have a, we have a, a, a user space application or a library who's parsing the stream and, and, in user space. And then you're using the Codec API uh, to actually send this data to, to the Linux kernel so that, again, the Linux kernel can, the driver and the kernel can program the device with the right metadata values. And Collabora has been merging support for the, for, for, for the Codec APIs for the major standards out there. This includes H.264, um, H.265, which are very famous, VP9, which is very famous in the open source world, and the up and coming AV1. Um, video codec, which is basically state of the art. Um, so yeah, anyhow, let's recap what we know so far, what, what, what we have discussed. So a video codec basically compresses and decompresses video. We need that because video is, raw video files are basically very large and we need some compression going. Um, we, we, we can do it faster using less power if we have a, if we, if we use hardware acceleration. If we're using hardware acceleration, if we have a separate piece of hardware just to encode or decode video, we need to have a, a, a driver and B, we need to have an API to talk to this driver and to the kernel. This presentation is about one of these APIs, namely the v V4L2 
um, API to, to, to drive referral to uh, um, decoders and encoders. For, for, for the referral to APIs, we have both the stateful and stateless flavors. There are two ways that you can communicate with referral to to, to encode and decode um, video. For the stateful API, we have a black box. We only send a bitstream and the device does its thing. It gives you the encoded or decoded data back. For the stateless API, the programmer has to do a little bit more work. It must also send another, another block of, of data, a, what we call the metadata, through the so-called codec APIs so that the driver can use the, the, these metadata values to actually program the, the, the device. And Collabra has been merging support for these APIs, UAPIs into the kernel. And some of them, some of the codecs that we have merged are open source like VP9 and AV1, and some aren't like H.264 or HVC. With all that said, we can finally understand what Visal is, the Visal driver, what is Visal? So Visal is a virtual stateless decoder driver. So we know what a stateless driver is, we know what a decoder is, it decodes video, we've talked about this previously, but the key word here is virtual. It doesn't drive real hardware, it doesn't drive a real accelerator. And But other than not driving a real driver, it presents itself to the kernel and to, to use the space programs just like any other driver would. And it implements something that we call a decode loop like any other driver would. It just does not drive any real um, any real device. Daniel? What is a decode? Yes. Um, sorry, there is a question in the chat. Would you like to answer that now or later? Yes, now, yes. Oh, okay. Um, so the uh, question is, uh, can stateful, can, stateful can be said as hardware codex? That's the question. Can you stateful. classify stateful as a hardware codex, codec? Well, both are driving hardware. Right, so so the if if you have a stateless codec, you're also driving hardware, um, unless you're using Visal, right? Because Visal is a virtual driver, so you can classify both stateful and stateless um, um, codecs as 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 you can use both of them to drive hardware. I think that answers the question. Okay, thank you. That's 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 the question we have. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, continue now. Thank you. Yes. How how many minutes do I have? Um, you are you are in at about um thirty five minutes into it, so you still have about an hour to go, roughly fifty five minutes to go. Oh, that's so that's you're in, you're doing good on time. Thank you. Of course. So, so going back just one slide, I said it implements a, a decode loop like any other codec driver. So what is a decode loop, right? Um. So I, I've taken this picture from Hans Recool, the uh, one of the maintainers in, in Video for Linux. So um, thanks, Hans, for, 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 this, for this diagram, basically. And what, what we can see in this diagram is, the, is a decoding loop, right? The oper and we can see how a, a, a V4L2 um, callback driver operates. So the very first thing that stands out is that we have two queues. So on the left-hand side, uh, it's written in bold on top that we have something called an output queue. And on the right-hand side, we have something called a capture queue. So the idea is that a user space program will run a loop. And it'll run this loop for as long as it has data to decode, right? And the loop consists of submitting, let's take a, a video decoder um, as, as an example. The, 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 a loop... To, to decode video consists of submitting um, the bitstream data into the output queue. And eventually you submit enough data that the, the codec device can start processing it. And eventually once the codec device starts processing this bitstream data, this compressed data, it will be able to produce decoded frames in the other queue, in the capture queue. And then user space can start to de de dequeue the buffers in the capture queue with the with the decoded data, and it's a loop. You you queue more you queue more um, raw bitstream data into the output queue, 
then you get more buffers with decoded data in the capture queue. And you, re you repeat this process until you have no more data to decode. So it's, it's a loop that's going on um, in, in, in the user space program. And the user space program will be talking to the kernel to, 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 so that the kernel can program the hardware to do the decoding. So, so Vizal sorry, uh, there is one question on the previous slide. I thought it might clarify things for people. Uh, the question uh, is the output queue is at input confusing. That's the question. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. This is very confusing. This is a very normal question to have. It's been a major point of debate in the virality community for years, basically. And to answer your question, yes, it's it's very confusing. But well, we, once I mean, the very first thing is we can't change this terminology right now, right? Because it's already in the kernel. But the 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 way that I used to think about it and other people think about it to clarify is that uh, if, if if you think from from a user space point of view, you are Okay, this is this is still gonna sound confusing, but it's less confusing. You're going to be outputting data into buffers, compressed data into buffers, and then you're going to be capturing data from 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 the kernel. Hopefully, this makes sense, right? So if you think about a webcam, I think it makes more sense. A webcam is not like a codec device. A webcam will have only one queue because there's only one thing that you can do with the webcam: capture the the video data, right? You're not sending um, any any, any compressed video data, you're only capturing data from, from the sensor. So this is where the name originated from. Capture queue kind of comes from like webcam devices, for instance, where you're capturing data. And then output queue, uh, it comes from the fact that you're outputting data to the device from a user space perspective. But yes, it's very confusing and it takes a little bit of, of training and practice before you can uh, not get too confused with, with these two terms. So as I was saying, uh, Visual will will the Visual driver will will implement a decoding loop as well. So from from the perspective of a user space program, there's no difference. The user space program doesn't really know that it's talking to a virtual driver. All it knows is that once it starts talking to this device, it can establish a loop in which it can send data to the device. The device will process quote unquote this data, and it can get data back from the device, like any other device, any other real device. So it doesn't, it doesn't really know that it's a virtual device at all. And what user space also know is that it can, it can use different codec standards with this device. So it knows that if, it, if it's reading VP8 data and VP8 is one standard, well, it can use this device to quote unquote decode it. If it's using, if it's reading VP9 data, if you gave your user space program a VP9 video file, it can also send it to, to Visal to decode. If it has HVC content, AVC content, MPEG2 content, it, it can send it to Visal. And as far as user space is concerned, Visal is decoding this thing, but not really because Visal, the, 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 the whole point of Visal being a virtual driver is that Visal doesn't really decode anything. And we're gonna talk more about what it means to not decode anything or why I'm saying decode in, in, in quotes. Like, But what you can use Visal for and why it's important, why it's useful is that you can trace a whole bunch of debug information through it. And why would you wanna do it? Why would you wanna trace anything, use the, the, the this virtual driver to trace anything? Well, because if you're if you're a a, a video codec uh, developer and you're writing uh, software to, to to drive a hardware accelerator B in 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 video for Linux, you want to have some feedback on what you're doing. You 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 want to have something that's going to make your life easier. And this something for now for video for Linux for us for stateless decoders, this thing is Visal. So in Visal, you can see the state of the queues. So you can see both the state of the capture queue and the output queue as I've, as I've shown in the previous slides. Why is it important? Well, because you, you have to queue and dequeue data into these two queues, right? You, you guys will remember from like 
uh, uh, two, three slides ago, that I said that you have to be queuing and dequeuing buffers constantly in, in, into these two queues until you have no more data to, to decode. And one of the things that you can do, for instance, when you're just getting started, is you can get this process wrong. It happens. And you hopefully you can catch this mistake by using Visal, because Visal will output for you the state of the queues, um, the state of the DPB. And the DPB, if you will remember from the beginning of the presentation, the DPB is is the is 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 a bunch of buffers basically basically containing previously decoded frames that you're using as a reference to the frame that you're currently decoding. And another thing that a, 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 a video codec programmer can do that will definitely um, throw a wrench into things and, and basically break the decoding process is to make a mistake when setting up the DPB. Um, saying that a picture should be part of the DPB when it shouldn't or evicting a picture from the DPB, a buffer from the DPB when it should be in the DPB. So if you make these mistakes, it'll break your your device basically, you 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 start to have some garbage. The device will start to put out to put out uh, garbage, or it can crash, saying that the address that you provided is invalid, and you know spit out a bunch of I/O MMU errors or something. And you don't want that to happen. And it one way that you can catch this is again by using Visal. You can trace the bitstream metadata that you have submitted because as I as we've as we have spoken previously, Visal is a stateful. I'm sorry, a stateless uh, driver. And by being a stateless driver, you have to use the codec Q APIs to send the codec metadata for Visal to, again, quote unquote, decode. We've spoken previously uh, about this when we were explaining about the stateless um, API and how a stateless device works. So with Visal, you can dump the metadata that you have sent. And why is it important for you to dump this metadata? Well. Because again, one of the things that you can do is you can send wrong metadata. It can have a broken parsing in user space. I parsed it that you thought that was correct, that you have debugged, but turns out that you were wrong. And there's a mistake, a tiny little mistake somewhere. And you can highlight this error by using Visal. You can you can dump this data and say, oh, I expect it to be, you know, XYZ value here, but I have a different value. This is wrong. And and how can you do this? This is another very important thing that Visal offers you. How, how can you know that you're supposed to have a given value for some metadata and you have a different value? Well, because you can run Visal with a working implementation. And this is very, very, very helpful. So let's say I, I'm working on the streamer and I, I have the streamer implementation um, ready and now I want to do a FFmpeg implementation. Well, if I'm starting from zero on FFmpeg, it's going to take me longer, much longer, but I don't have to start from zero. I can use Visal to trace the distributor implementation that I know it's working because while well, I use it and I can see visually that it's decoding video fine, it's the results look good. So I can use Visal to trace it. And now I can use the, 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 the trace that Visal provides me and compare that with a trace that Visal provides me for the FFmpeg implementation, compare that with the Jstreamer implementation and, and say, oh, these two things, they don't match. So here's what I have to fix in order to get them to match between Jstreamer and FFmpeg. This is very helpful. And this is not new, by the way. So other APIs like VA API, which is another video API that I work with, they also have similar mechanisms like VA trace. And believe me, I've used like VA trace for a long time. Well, if you don't have this kind of mechanism, it's much, much, much harder for you to write um, video codec uh, um, software. So Daniel, there is a question in the uh, Q&A. Uh, looks like there are two of them. Um, I can read them to you if you can't see them. Uh, would you, can you see them or do you want me to read them? No, I can see them, but okay. if you want to read them, that's fine. Okay, okay. Codec UAPI, UAPI when used, uh, Visal user space should also send the metadata, correct? If yes, how? If if you if if I'm on, if I understood correctly, the question is: Should we send the metadata to Visal as well? This is this. Can you can you repeat the question? Yes. Uh, Codec UAPI 
when used visal, user space should also send the metadata, correct? Um, if yes, how? I don't, I don't know. Uh, Gautam, will you be able to rephrase this question? I don't think it's really, it's not clear to me um, also. Daniel, if it's clear to you, go ahead. But otherwise, I'll we can ask Gautam to rephrase. Yeah. I think I think I understand what the person is mm -hmm. trying to ask. If if we're using Visal, should we also send the metadata? The answer is yes. You should also send the metadata, because as, again, Visal is a stateless driver like any other driver. It's just virtual; it doesn't drive real hardware. But that's the only difference. So yes, you should also send metadata. And for the second uh, part of this question, which is how how should you send the metadata? Well, like any other driver, like how do you send the metadata? For, for a driver that's driving real hardware through the Codec API that we have spoken previously. So I, I can, I, this is actually a really good question. So, so the way that you send metadata through user space is there's some, there's, there's this thing in video for Linux called V4L2 controls. And I assume you know what an IOCTO is. Uh, there's IOCTOs to, to to basically set data into this into these controls, and then this is how you implement the Codec API. Because we've spoken about the Codec API, but we haven't said so far how is this thing really implemented into co into code. So how it works is you have a bunch of of controls, which is just a bunch of structs basically containing a bunch of data that you can fill, and then you fill this in user space. And then you you issue an, I, an IOCTAL from user space to tell the kernel, hey, I want to, I want to, uh, I want you to set the the values that I have just sent you, and I want you to use these values to program the hardware. This is how you set the metadata in Visal. This is how you set the metadata in any driver through through the VFL2 controls. So let let me add. Uh a little bit um, to what you already said, Daniel, if you, if I may. Uh, this is uh, a virtual driver. If you think of it as a virtual driver, um, it is equivalent to any other mechanism. You would just say that it is a driver and you assume that there is, um, it is simulating a behavior of a hardware very similar to QMU does uh, on ARM architecture, for example. You can run a QMU and it will uh, emulate um, an architecture. So what that does is this is the, we this has been around the co concept of simulation and emulation has been around for a very long time. If you were to say a, an organization or a, a product development is developing hardware from their end OS and user space are uh, responsible for doing all of that. If they were to serialize all of these things, developing hardware first and then firmware first, and then go to running, uh, verifying the kernel, it takes a very long time to get anything out. So the concept is that you would um, simulate um, how the hardware works so that you can verify um, your uh, kernel way before you can have the physical hardware ready. So this is in similarly, virtual drivers help us. We have other virtual drivers as well. VIMC is another virtual driver. Um, Visal is one. And we have few other drivers in the video. Uh, Linux Media. Linux Media does a very good, developers do a very good job of providing these for the user space though, so that they can continue to test them. Um, without dependent on hardware. Um, that's how I view these things. Daniel, if you can um, comment on what I said, if you like. Yes, uh, so so we, we also have other um, virtual drivers, as, as you said, in the, in the media subsystem. And one of the things that, that, that we wanna be able, and I'm also going to be talking about this in, in a few slides in the future, is is to test without hardware, and this is one of the major use cases for Visal for now. So, we we want to we want to make sure that even though you don't have the hardware to, because not all machines have hardware for all codecs. 
Um, so in front of me, I have like, I don't know, two, three different machines, a few different boards with different SOCs, and 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 they all different in cap. They all differ in capabilities. So you can imagine that it's very possible, in fact, very likely, that the, the machine that you're testing won't have support for all codecs. But nevertheless, you want to be able to test other components like the user space stack that, that, that you're using to drive it. Let's say that you're a company using a GStreamer to, 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 to drive your product. You want to make sure that this doesn't break. You can use the Viso driver. Um, I think Google is moving to use the Viso driver to test their implementation in Chromium. So, so testing without hardware, yes, it's it's one of the major use cases for Visal. There are a couple of questions in Q and A. Um, if you would like to get them now or later, um, yes, go yes, ahead no, and no, it's fine. Okay, um, there is a question from uh, Premdeep. As it as it is Visor based, can we have multiple instances of same codec running in parallel? by diff app and accept not much delay. If we can have different instances of the same um, driver, the same app. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know. What? Actually, yes, but it doesn't, this doesn't have to do with Visal in particular, and it has more to do with the fact that a stateless driver is a clean slate. So with, as, as we said, the whole idea behind a clean slate is that you can program it, um, you set all the data, you ask it to do, to, to carry out a workload, it does it, and it returns without storing, um, without storing state within the device. So what this means is you can have, let's say two, two streams, like two sessions with very different uh, medias uh, playing and it doesn't matter because, as, as we said, the the device is stateless. So you program all the you, you program all the registers and everything to decode a given stream. The hardware will carry out the workload, and then you can immediately program it with another completely unrelated stream, and it it'll work just as fine. And this has to do with it being a stateless device. I have one at, more at question. Yeah. yeah, okay. There yes. is one more question. How fast is the codec when used Visal versus hardware? I'm thinking <laughs> performance difference. I mean, hardware is going to be faster, very likely, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, Visal is very fast because Visal isn't doing anything. So, so like actual hardware is, is very fast as well. But like if you're submitting a 4K, um, if you're submitting a 4K stream, let's say, and you're asking hardware to decode it, it's not trivial, right? It's gonna, well, it's faster, but it's still some workload that it has to carry out. Whereas Visal, you're submitting, as we said in, in the previous slides, you're submitting the 4K stream the same as you would with the physical driver, with a real driver and the metadata, but Visal will not touch the actual 4K content. It's not gonna touch the actual compressed data because it doesn't decode data. All it does, it's dump. It dumps out. Um, it dumps out the metadata as we as we spoke, and it dumps out debug information. But it doesn't do the actual workload of actually decoding the data, so it can be very fast. Okay, one last question in the chat. Uh, you mentioned this is useful when there is no hardware support for the available codecs, but these codecs are mostly established and supported with current desktop systems. Is or will there be a support for AV1? Okay, so let's split this question into two, two questions. And it's, it's this is a very good question, by the way. So the, the, the first part of the question says that it, they're established and there is already support for the majority of them. Well, uh, yes, but not really at the same time. Uh, so if you take like AV1, I wouldn't say support for AV1 is widespread. I, for instance, as, as I was saying, I have like three machines in front of me. None of them have AV1 support. And they're newish machines, machines I bought like one, two years ago. 
So if you have an Intel device, you have to have, I think, Gen 11 or Gen 12 to have V1. If you have an NVIDIA GPU, you have to have one of the 40XX series, so 4080s, 4090s. Um, so my point here being AV1 hardware support is not widespread at all. So, so there's a bit of a, of a uh, misunderstanding there, I think. And, and even for older codecs, you can use what you just said for like older codecs. Well, HVC or H64 are already very established. They've been around for like 10 years for HVC or 20 plus years for H264. Yes, but you may have some device that do not can, may not be able to decode it. You know, it it's not as common because they've been around for longer, but it can happen. And if it does happen, you want to be prepared. If you're testing, um, you you want to be able to test all of them basically, um, and 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 be, be prepared uh, no matter what hardware you actually have, the, the capabilities of the actual hardware you have, and. And the, the second part of the question is about AV1 support. Will there be AV1 support? Yes. Um, in fact, people have submitted a patch for AV1 support yesterday. So it's pending review. But but to answer your question, yes, there will be AV1 support in Visal as well. Thank you, Daniel. Um, hey, um, start your, uh, resume your uh, presentation. I don't know how much is left and you have about um, 32 minutes. So yes, go ahead. There's, there's not much left. Yes. Let's, okay. let's continue. So why should we bother with a virtual driver like Visal? I think I've, I've already uh, gone through most of the content here because it helps you test your code, your user space code when you don't have the hardware, helps you prototype. So I, when I, I wrote the AV1 stateless support in, in the Linux kernel and one of the things I wrote Visal for is I was using Visal to prototype what worked and what didn't work. So it's easier when you're still in the, in, 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 in the, in the development stage, when you have a virtual driver that, that you can um, tinker around with it and, and see what works and what doesn't work, uh, what is ergonomic, what isn't ergonomic. Um, so, so it helps with this. I also said that you can have a working user space implementation and use that uh, to develop a new implementation and, and use Visal to help you out with this. This helps, this helps out tremendously. I can't stress enough um, how much it's helpful to, to, a, to be able to trace to trace things with, with a driver, to trace a working implementation with a driver when you're developing um, code for, for a new app. And how is Visal different from a real driver? I think we've touched upon this as well. Real drivers, the, 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 the actual difference between Visal and a real driver. Well, first, the obvious thing is that a real driver will use the metadata um, that you pass in, as we said, using the, the code IQ API. A real driver will use this to actually program a real device. So it will arrange with the kernel um, so that it, it, it will be able to talk to a real device through through DMA. Um, and then it will use this, um, the metadata that you have sent in order to write actual device uh, device registers um, and actual device memory to, so that you can tell the device um, of, of the, you can, you can send the metadata, uh, the, the data. I'm sorry, the metadata directly to the device, so that the device can process uh, with with the workload. So a, a real driver will send the metadata, use the metadata to program the device. Visal will not program any, any device because it doesn't have an underlying device. What Visal will do instead is it'll use the metadata to program the VFRL2 test pattern generator. And what is the test pattern generator? It's a a piece of code, a component written by Hans Rickule, who again is one of the VFRL2 maintainers. And what it does, it, it uses this to actually write a bunch of strings, a bunch of debug information directly into the capture buffers, basically. So if you run Visal um, with the streamer, for instance, what, what you get when you, when you inspect the, the frames is you get a bunch of color bars which is, was written by the default to test pattern generator. And you also get a bunch of strings, right? A bunch of text that, 
that was also written by the Vifrol 2 test spreader generator. And this text uh, contains a bunch of information about the stream that you can use to debug it, basically. And Visal will also use um, Ftrace to, to, to dump this information. And I think the main difference from, from Visal to a real driver, as we've spoken you know, at length here, is that Visal doesn't decode any video. It uses the test better generator to, to dump uh, information to the capture buffers instead of decoding um, video um, itself. Another question that people usually ask, I have been asked this a, a couple of times, is how is Visal different from, from Vcodec? And Vcodec, to start off with, is a different driver entirely. It's another driver. And unlike, unlike Visal, um, VI Codec can actually encode and decode video using its own codec standard, which is um, F FWHT. So FWHT can actually encode and decode video. It's it's a it's a real um, codec standard, so to speak. Albeit it's a very simple one. It, it was written, I think, one person wrote it as part of his academic thesis. I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but it's functional. It works. That's that's the point. And it can actually encode and decode. But it's not used in industry. It's not like HVC or H.264 or AV1 that's what's that has widespread um, use in the industry. It's it's a, it's a more simple um, standard. And unlike Visal, the iCodec also has stateful support, which Visal again doesn't, because Visal is very focused on testing um, the stateless beautiful Linux two APIs. And I think to I'm I'm starting to 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 wrap up this presentation. One of the the points I want to make. Um, before I'm done here, is that if you understand Visal for the newcomers here, if you understand Visal, you understand how codec drivers work. If if you go through, because the major parts are there, how you how you can interact with uh, VB2 with the video buff two um, API, uh, with the M2M API, how you can get the driver to to probe, um, how you can you know access the the values, the the metadata in the controls, and and how you can set up a what we call a VFRL two control handler, you know, every all these little aspects of how, of how you write a real driver they're in Visal. So for anybody who's out there who may be thinking, how do I write my first driver for real hardware? Where do I get started? I would say get started with Visal. Everything you need is in there, and then obviously you have to figure out the specifics of your device that you're trying to program, right? You have to have some supporting material to tell you how to program that particular hardware. But the general workflow and the general idea, you can get it pretty easily from, from Visal, in my opinion. There are also examples of real codec drivers out there that you guys can, can check. I I like our KV deck. That was the first codec driver I've ever came, came across uh, when I was getting started with this line of work. Um, codec uh, the the RKV deck driver is 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 the driver that drives a bunch of uh, rock chip products. For instance, I have I have the RK thirty five ninety nine SOC standing on a board right here in front of me, and this is driven by RKV deck. Um, we have Hentro, which is a video IP from Very Silicon, which is present again in a number of SOCs out there, and you can see it in drivers slash media platform Very Silicon. Cedras, which is again a very cool project. It's reverse engineered from, it's it's a reverse engineer work from all winner SOCs, and you, it's also a staging um, driver. You can check it out at drivers slash staging slash media slash sunshi, I think. So you can check these real drivers if you want to see how a um, how a driver for a real device actually operates and how it differs from from Visal. And to wrap it up, um, how do I run Visal? I think is important if, if you wanna, you, you don't need any, as we have been saying over and over and over this presentation, again, you don't need any hardware. You can run it on your laptop if you want. All you need is an, an, a newish version of Jishimer, version 1.18 at minimum, which was released in 2020. You have to have that installed. And once you do, you mod probe Visal. And then you have to run a Jishimer pipeline. I don't know how many of you are acquainted with Jishimer or what Jishimer is. Um, Jishimer is a major software on Linux and other platforms. And what it does, it's a multimedia framework. Um, like, I don't know how many of you guys know, for instance, 
Pipewire or GNU Radio. All these softwares they operate, you know, very similarly from from a from a logic perspective with Streamer. And the idea is you have different elements, and you connect these elements through pads. And once you connect, you can connect different elements um, to carry out a workload. And and this is what I mean. This is what they mean when they say it's a it's a multimedia framework. You connect different elements, and then once you one element will, for instance, parse a stream, the other element can talk to Vifrel two, for instance, and and have Vifrel two decode it. Another element can talk to um, GRM or um, KMS and have that displayed on 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 your display and so on and so forth, and. A simple way to do it without having too much code, without having any code at all, actually, with only from the from the command line from the terminal, is through a, a tool called GST Launch 1.0, which is part of Distreamer. And what GST Launch 1.0 does, it's it takes a string, and this and this string is going you're going to describe your pipeline and connect elements together. So in this example pipeline that I have here, we have three different elements. Not really, well, I'd say we have four, but not really four. I'm going to um, explain why. So the first thing is file source. File source will basically read some file in your disk, and you can control what file it's going to read by this location property. So you're going to point it at some path in your file system. It's going to read a file. The exclamation mark connects one, one um, element to the next element. So now, here I'm connecting file source with parse bin. And parse bin is a collection of elements. It doesn't really matter for this presentation. Just just think of uh, just think of parse bin as you're telling the streamer, hey, figure out how many elements I need automatically in order to parse whatever file source is giving you. So parse bin will automatically expand into the right elements that you need in order to parse the the the, the video data you're giving it through file source. And then you're connecting parse bin to um, a V4L2 decoder element. In this particular case, this element will decode H.264 um, video data. And this element will actually talk to the kernel, set up um, the driver, and then this element will um, coordinate with the driver to get a decode, decode loop going, as we've seen in the previous slides. And this element will take care of getting the buffer, getting the memory, sending this memory to the kernel with the compressed data, sending the metadata to the kernel, getting the decoded frame back, getting into a nice tight format that Jishimer understands, and then passing this along to another element. And this other element is the last element in this pipeline. It's called file sync. And file sync will get this, this meta, this, I'm sorry, will get this data, this decoded data, and it will, all it's going to do is it's going to store it for you in some path that, that you tell it through this location property. So if you mod probe Visal and you run this pipeline, it's going to work just as if you had any other driver. If I had RKV deck, uh, it, it was going to be the same pipeline. If I had RKV deck, if I had Cedras, any other driver, if I run the same pipeline with them or with Visal, it's going to work just the same as far as Jishimer is concerned. So what should I expect? Well, Jishimer will start playing your file. Once you hit enter with that pipeline, Jishimer will start playing your file for you. And the file sync element, as I said, will write the decoded quote unquote data into a file. And then I can you can inspect what is in there through any program you want. And one example that I use the most, that people over here at Collabor use the most, is a piece of software called YUView. So with YUView, you'll tell it the resolution and it's going to interpret that YUV data for you. And then you can see the actual decoded frames. You can see what Visal has written through the v 2 test pattern generator. It, you can see all the debug data that has been written in, in the frame through YU view. And you can also um, use ftrace if you want. So Candace, I, I think I sent you a link at the beginning of the presentation. Can you open it, please? Yes, let me. I'm going to take over sharing the screen um, so I can show that. Uh, let's see. While Candice is doing that, there is a question here. Why was state stateless? If you would like to take this question now, or Daniel, first of yes. all. 
that's yeah, okay. that's fine yes okay why was stateless hardware created in the first place what advantage does it offer for hardware manufacturers um, or user space as compared to stateful hardware well for for manufacturers for vendors it's it's simpler right you get to have simpler hardware basically because if you remember if you have a stateful device you have to have more stuff you have to have a way to parse the bitstream in hardware and extract all that data yourself and keep track of that data yourself. Uh, and when I say yourself, I mean the hardware has to be able to do so internally. So it's more complex, right? And if you have a stateless um, device for a vendor, it's, it's simpler, but there's no magic here, right? The work that the vendor isn't doing by having a stateless device uh, being simpler and everything somebody has to do. And this somebody is the user space programmer. So the responsibilities that, that, that are handled automatically by hardware in a stateful uh, device is, has to be taken care of by the programmer in a stateless uh, device. So you have to have more user space code to drive it basically. But you may think, whoa, so it's, it's more complicated for, for the programmer, for the developer, yes, but it's not all that bad for the following reason. As a programmer, uh, and we've said we said uh, we said this previously. You 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 tackle a stateful device as a black box. I said that, and it turns out that we programmers do not like black boxes, right? Because if something's broken, if you're not sure uh, wh where you have a mistake, or if you have broken hardware. Um, then there's not much that you can do. It's again, it's a black box. You don't have much control. Once you submit the data, you don't have much control over what's going on. Versus when you have something in software, if it's broken, okay, you just uh, you just in a patch, you patch that, people take that upstream and you have just solved your problem most of the time. So as programmers, uh, I must say, we also like stateless devices. It takes more code, it's more complicated, but you're more in control of what's going on. There is one other question. Um, also, given that user space software now has to parse the bitstream, doesn't it mean that user space drivers have to now pay royalties for patented codecs like H264, H265, whereas previously, because they just blindly sent the bit in a bitstream, they wouldn't have to pay royalties? This is a very good question. I, I actually have a presentation that's just about AV1 and why we need AV1 basically. And it has to do with patents and and, 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 and basically what this person has just asked. So what we are seeing in, in recent times is um, people are basically telling that, for instance, Fedora, if I'm not mistaken, has has basically disabled support for VA API, I think, by default on their distribution. So it's a kind of hot potato sort of situation. Uh, so they're saying that if you enable, um, for instance, if you're decoding H.264 or HEVC, maybe you're supposed to be paying for royalties. And if, if you're not complying, it's on you, basically. So, so people are basically pushing the, the problem around. So, so for Fedora, I think it doesn't come enabled. The API for, for support for a bunch of codecs doesn't come enabled by default for precisely this, re this reason. Um, but nowadays, I am not really aware of um, royalty payments being made on behalf of, of uh, FOSS software. We, we have a tendency to, in the streamer, for instance, we have a tendency to, to, uh, to separate these things into, to contain these things into different modules. So, so if, you have, if you have like the code to, to, to decode H.264 and, H, and HVC and so on, it's, it's, it's contained into a, into a module called GST plugins bad which means that, again, you may have some issues with, with, uh, with, with royalties and, and so on. But I'm not aware of uh, 
payments being made of on behalf of, of free and open source software thus far. Okay, I think that's all we have in the chat and um, and the Q and A right now. Thanks, Daniel. So you can continue. With uh, actually, that. I'm I'm waiting for Candice actually. Oh, okay. I think she um, has that up oh, right yes. now. Yes. I, I was looking at my own presentation. It was never going to show up. <laughs> Uh, Candice, can you, can you open the second link, actually, the other link? Yep, this one. Yes, this one. So I, what I want to show here, it can, can you scroll down a little bit? Yep. A tad more? Yes, this is, this is good. So, so what I was going to say is on top of, um, on top of using Visal to, to dump the data into the frames themselves through the uh, VFL2 test pattern generator, the other thing you can do is use ftrace. So Visal will have a, a different number of trace events. And through these um, through these trace events using ftrace, you can dump the metadata. So what we have here in the uh, what we have here being shown is the metadata for some he some hvc file that i was i was playing you can see how you can um, um tell visal what specific piece of metadata you want to display in the line above so you say equal one to debug slash tracing slash events slash visal hvc controls indicating that you want to dump well hvc controls then specifically you want to dump the sps values for for this particular hvc stream through for our two control HVC SPS enable, and then Visal once you once you cat the trace buffer, what you're going to see is the values for the different fields that the the user space application has submitted to Visal, and this is also a way you can use to to debug. So you can see the values that it has submitted, for instance, for the video parameter set ID, the sequence parameter set ID. You can see the resolution, and basically all the values that you have submitted to the driver will show up. In, in the in the trace buffer, uh, and 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 this is this is enough. This is also no. Can you scroll down a little bit more? Another thing that's very helpful, in my opinion, that you can do is you can trace the the uh, the contents of the output um, of the output uh, buffers using Visal. And why is this important? Because again, another mistake that you can make is that you can think that the compressed data starts at a given offset, but it truly doesn't. Because again, the, you, your parser may have a bug somewhere, and, and a tiny bug, and now you have computed the offset to the, to the actual, uh, to the start of the data, the compressed data. You have computed the wrong offset, for instance. And if you do this, what's gonna happen is, is that you're gonna pass either incomplete data, or you're gonna pass data that's not really compressed data, and that the decoder will attempt to decode that and it's gonna crash at some point. So one way that you can use Visal to help you debug is by using by using uh, by dumping through debugfs and seeing whether you're passing the right data by comparing with the working implementation. This is what I wanted to show here, Candace. Thank you. No problem. Did you want to start sharing your screen again? Yes, please. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop. And then you can pull up yours. Yes. Are, are you guys seeing the presentation again? Yes. So again, don't forget to play with the different um, options when loading the module. You can see that the different options in the uh, documentation. You have uh, you can control the amount of information that's that's dumped. Uh, you can control a particular frame at which you want to start to dump and a particular frame at which you want to stop the, the, the dumping process. You can control that through through options. And we're, we're almost done here. And the last thing I want to say is why should you care? And the reason you should care is because multimedia is ubiquitous. Basically, it's it's one of the things we use computers the most for, as, at least as consumer, uh, as far as consumer devices go. So there's a there is a research that was done by Cisco, and, and it predicted that by 2022 this thing was 
this 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 was carried out uh, i think three four years ago and it predicted that by 2022 82 percent of all consumer internet traffic would be video data especially with the the rise of 4k and, and hk um so video is one of the things that we use computers the most as end users and really having a good story um, in, in the multimedia stack for an operating system is fundamental. Being able to support more hardware to, to provide a flawlessly um, environment to, to, to encode and decode data, this is very important for, for an OS to, to have. So improving the, the multimedia stack in, in Linux makes the, the entire operating system more appealing um, as a whole. It's, it's like gaming. It's, it's one of the things that people care about. People want to see that supported, basically. And in my opinion, it's a very uh, challenging and, 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 and interesting line of work. Uh, I, I like it. I like debugging it. It's, it's like, I think that the problems in this domain are very interesting. It, it, it's, it can be a very fulfilling um, career path. And, and, and the last thing... I want to say is that if anyone here is interested in, in following along um, this career path, the VFRL2 community can really use more members, more contributors, especially contributors that can um, one day evolve or grow into being maintainers and, and helping out with, with code reviews and, and, and helping out the community. The, the VFRL2 community is really in need of these people. So there is a space. For, for more people in this area for, for Linux and for VFRL2. And this concludes what I had to say. I hope this was informative uh, for, for the audience here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. And plus one on what Daniel said, uh, VFRL2 community is very welcoming. And um, the work is very challenging because of the devices. They are complex devices. One, each device might could have multiple drivers associated with it. Some of the uh, problems that uh, uh, I solved in that space, um, they have been the most fulfilling ones for me. Uh, like Daniel mentions, and um, some of the mentors, the developers there, they are uh, eager to. Uh, help new developers um they're always supporting and so yes um plus one on any everything daniel said and as for gaming if we ever want linux to be successful as a gaming platform um linux media is it you really need linux media and v4l and video support to be able to succeed in that space so thank you for uh doing this webinar daniel Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you for having me here. Thank you both Daniel and Shua for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. And a copy of the presentation slides will be available on the Linux Foundation website. We hope you are able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day.